Okay. Good afternoon, everyone um, who has joined the uh, Zoom conference for uh, this discussion of uh, contemporary surgical treatment of differentiated papillary and follicular thyroid cancer and recurrent thyroid cancer. My name is Alex Harbison. I'm an assistant professor at Johns Hopkins University, and I am a head and neck endocrine surgeon, and I am deeply grateful for the opportunity to talk about this topic that's near and dear to my heart, as well as the, uh, those of you uh, listening. So without further ado, I'll get started. All right, I don't have any conflicts of interest to mention. So in terms of the objectives that I am interested in covering today, so I wanted to define the problem. So the increasing incidence yet stable mortality of thyroid cancer. Uh, incidence meaning how frequently or the rate at which it's occurring. And then discuss the concept of decreasing morbidity of treatment and how that pertains to the extent of treatment or the side effects of treatment. Uh, so starting out, there's been a rise in the detection of thyroid nodules that essentially would have never been detected, or we call this occult, because they're not causing symptoms. They're not protruding from the neck. They're not causing difficulty swallowing or breathing. Um, and you can see here in this uh, figure, so on the x-axis are uh, uh, epochs of time, and then on the y-axis, um, on the y-axis uh, is the uh, rate uh, per 100,000 people. And so you can see uh, the clinically occult, which are these dashed gray lines um, over time, and especially between 1999 and 2012 really took off. So the rate of these occult uh, thyroid nodules became much more frequent. And why were we recognizing thyroid nodules so much more frequently? Well, um, in, in part, it's because of increased availability of our ultrasonography techniques. In part, it's because uh, some of these nodules are, are identified on CAT scans that people might get for one reason or another. It might be for neck pain or for uh, lung screening if they are uh, if they uh, have any risk for lung cancer um, and and so what's been interesting you would think well if we're seeing increase incidence or an increased rate of uh, thyroid nodules being discovered um, and also thyroid cancer being discovered as shown on these two plots here you you might think you might ask, well, um, what's happening to the death rate or mortality? And you can see here in these two different studies, the study on the left is from Memorial Sloan Kettering. And you see that over time, the incidence of thyroid cancer went up and the mortality, which is the purple line on the bottom, really has stayed the same over that entire study period. Interestingly, there's some data from Olmsted County, Minnesota, and this was published by the Mayo Clinic, and they found that the rate of thyroid cancer had doubled between the 1990 to 99 and 2000 to 2012 time periods, yet we see that there was no change in the mortality, which are these long dashed gray lines. So that's interesting. So thyroid cancer is going up, but you know the death rate's not going up. And so there, you know, has been a lot of public attention about this in terms of wondering whether, you know, are we are we overdiagnosing thyroid cancer? Do we really need to, you know, be be looking for this if it's not going to change the the death rate? Um, and so, you know, this has led us to, you know, ask, well, what are the goals of therapy? And this is, these are the goals of therapy as, as described in the American 
Thyroid Association guidelines, the 2015 ATA guidelines. So one is to remove the primary tumor. Two is to minimize the risk of the disease coming back or recurring and to minimize the risk of the disease spreading or metastasizing. Three is to facilitate post-operative radioactive iodine. So for a cancer that has high risk features and high risk of recurrence, we might administer radioactive iodine after surgery. And so by removing the thyroid gland, which soaks up the iodine, that allows the iodine to ablate or kill any remaining tumor cells. Fourth is to permit accurate staging and risk stratification. So even if we see the size and characteristics of a nodule on the ultrasound and in the operating room, the final pathologic assessment might give us more pause for or cause for concern or less, or it might not change it at all. And then fifth, and I've italicized, bold, and underlined this because one of the main goals of therapy is to minimize treatment-related morbidity. So that means the side effects of our treatment, because as, as we know, surgery is a, a scary thing to be faced with. Um, and we want to minimize the side effects of whatever treatment we do, especially if it's not going to change you know, your, your outcome in terms of your, how long you might, you know, be expected to live, uh, your prognosis. Um, and so it's a very fine balance we have to strike between controlling the cancer and the, the uh, consequences that the cancer has on the local tissue and the problems we can cause by doing surgery, which is an uh, invasive process. And, and so it, this study was interesting because we saw that, so again, this is, these are incidence rates or rates of occurrence over time in these four different plots. And in plot B, we see that low risk uh, cancers, these dotted lines here, increased over time to a much greater extent than high-risk cancers. And, and that's probably in part because we're picking up cancers earlier, but even the high-risk cancers here, we see that you know there, there might've been a little bit of an increase, but not anywhere as much as the low-risk cancers. Interestingly, so if you look at the dotted line here in, the, in plot C, the number of patients who received a total thyroidectomy, so that's near total or complete removal of the thyroid gland, really went up between 2000 and 2012, whereas those patients receiving a lobectomy or removing just half of the thyroid gland went down. So that's interesting. So why were we doing more total thyroidectomies when the risk, when these high risk cancers were not going up, the low risk cancers were. And that takes us to some of these findings, which is that the extent of surgery as inferred by a number of studies does not affect survival for intermediate sized tumors. So tumors one to two centimeters or two to four centimeters. Um, so this plot on the left basically shows the proportion of patients alive over time and follow-up, so 15-year follow-up, and you see the solid line represents patients undergoing lobectomy, the dashed line, patients undergoing total thyroidectomy. So whether or not patients in this cohort, which were tumors one to four centimeters in size, received part of their, had part of their thyroid removed or the whole thyroid removed it did make a difference in their survival. And additionally, you see if, if when they broke it up in the one to two centimeter um, size range or two to four centimeter size range, that also did not make a difference in the survival. This, this was a study using a public database of 61,000 patients. And another study using 
the SEER database, which is the Surveillance Epidemiology and End Results Database. It's another public database um, of outcomes. Uh, also confirm that the extent of surgery does not affect survival for smaller to medium-sized tumors. And so you see here the uh, top lines are the low-risk tumors, and these are patients who underwent partial or thyroidectomy or a lobectomy, and the uh, patients who underwent a total thyroidectomy. And there really was, you know, a, a marginal difference. So this is the percent of patients surviving over this 12-year period. And then the two lines at the bottom are patients with high-risk tumors, so tumors with a higher risk of recurrence who had a partial or total thyroidectomy. And, and here also, interestingly, in this data set, there was not a difference in survival based on the extent of surgery. And there could be a, several factors that weigh into that. There's a lot of different things that affect the, the likelihood of recurrence, the survival, um, and it's difficult to, to control for all of that when you're doing, when you're doing a, a large uh, retrospective analysis. So this brings up the questions, how have things changed in our surgical management of primary differentiated thyroid cancer? So, so these are the ATA guidelines from 2009 led by Dr. David Cooper. Uh, and so in recommendation 26, you see, we see here that for patients with thyroid cancer larger than one centimeter in size, the initial surgical procedure should be a near total or total thyroidectomy unless there are contraindications to surgery, such as the, the patient's not fit for surgery due to heart problems or lung or kidney problems, for example. And they also recommended that thyroid lobectomy alone may be sufficient for small. So at that time, we did know that, okay, for smaller tumors, we could take out just a half of the thyroid. As long as they're low risk, there's only one spot of tumor, we call that unifocal, and it's intrathyroidal, meaning it's within the thyroid. Um, and, the, and also in the absence of other risk factors like prior head and neck radiation, such as from treatment for a head and neck cancer uh, or uh, presence of um, metastasis to the lymph nodes in the neck. So this was just 2009. And then you know, comes the updated 2015 uh, ATA guidelines. And this brought a number of changes. You can see that in recommendation 35 now, uh, there are three parts, parts A, B, and C, um, not just a single recommendation to take out the whole thyroid for anyone with a tumor larger than one centimeter. So you see here, we, based on those data that I showed you earlier, our field saw those data and thought, well, you know, we need to balance the effects of our treatment with the survival outcomes or the oncologic control. So in part A, so for patients with thyroid cancer greater than four centimeters or other risk factors, we said the patient should undergo a near total or total thyroidectomy. So as before, as before, we had said for patients with a thyroid cancer greater than one centimeter, we should take out the whole thyroid. Now we're saying greater than four centimeters. So four times bigger. For patients with thyroid cancer greater, so between one and four centimeters, uh, without these high-risk features, a either a bilateral procedure, so a total thyroidectomy, or a unilateral procedure, a lobectomy. So basically, now we have the option to remove what, uh, part, the part of the thyroid containing the tumor, so a half of the thyroid or the whole thyroid, and it's an option. And there are different factors, which I'll talk about a little bit later as to how you can decide on whether you would, one would want to take out part or the whole thyroid. Now, it's alluded to a little bit here that the treatment team may choose total thyroidectomy to enable radioactive iodine uh, therapy. As we mentioned, if, if there's any concern that, that 
there may be some high risk feature of the can of the thyroid cancer that would necessitate radioactive iodine after surgery, then you would want to take out the whole thyroid so that you don't have to go back for a second surgery if you'd only taken out half to begin with. And then lastly, Part C remains the same as the 2009 guidelines in that for patients with thyroid cancer less than one centimeter and no other concerning features, removing part of the, the half of the thyroid with the cancer in it is sufficient. So this is where it became, becomes really interesting. So just by way of review, total thyroidectomy, remove the whole thyroid for tumors larger than four centimeters with these risk factors. So extra thyroidal extension means the tumors growing out of its envelope, metastasis to the neck or distant sites, meaning the tumor has spread to the lymph nodes in the, the central or the middle part of the neck or the lateral or the sides of the neck or distant sites like the lungs, for example. And then tumors between one and four centimeters, you could take out half or the whole thyroid and then tumors less than one centimeter, you could take out half the thyroid unless there is, as we mentioned, a purpose or a reason to take out the whole thyroid. And then some considerations that people might take into account one might be if the patient's already on thyroid hormones, so removing the whole thyroid really won't change much other than they might need to go up on their thyroid hormone. And so why not just take out the whole thyroid since you're gonna be taking out half anyways for the cancer. And also is this idea of multifocality. So papillary thyroid cancers can be present in multiple spots. Um, within the gland. So we might only see one nodule or we might see a few nodules, but there's about anywhere from a 30 to 40% chance that you might actually have multiple spots of thyroid cancer that we just can't see. Or maybe we do see other small nodules on the other side of the thyroid, but sometimes we don't because they're really tiny. And would they do anything? Well, they could grow several years later if you didn't have the other half of the thyroid, thyroid removed, but that depending on the patient's values and motivations that maybe it is, you know, maybe their values are that they don't want to have to take medication. And so they would prefer to just try start out with removing half the thyroid and then see what the pathology shows. And if needed, do another procedure to remove the rest of the thyroid. So this sort of led to the, this idea of active surveillance. So for small tumors, you can opt for no intervention. And what do I mean by that? It's really, it's not really no intervention. We're still intervening. We're still caring for you. But what it means is that we're not doing surgery. We're not doing anything invasive that could cause harm uh, or side effects. And so these are some information. These are some data from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And uh, in this study, the, the team followed a group of 291 patients over five years who had tumor, th papillary thyroid cancers less than one and a half centimeters. And essentially they documented both the uh, increase in by three millimeters of these nodules or an increase in the volume of the nodule greater than 50%. And so what they found was that the growth in tumor diameter of three millimeters or more was, was observed in about 4% of patients um, at this two to three year time mark um, with a cumulative incidence or basically an overall rate of about 12% of five years. So 12% of these nodules grew more than greater than or equal to three millimeters, um, in this time frame. And then, and then, um, in terms of volume, about a quarter of them, 25% of them grew by more than 50%. In, interestingly, in this study, there were no metastases to the neck or to the lungs or other sites during this active surveillance period. And five patients with growth in their 
tumor um, of three millimeters or more ended up undergoing surgery. So a very small fraction ended up needing sur or electing for surgery based on the increase in the size of the nodule over the time period. And so furthermore, um, as I mentioned, this memorial Sloan Kettering and some of our uh, the data from Japan and Korea um, have followed tumors up to 1.5 centimeters, but we're now thinking that tumors that are contained within the thyroid up to two centimeters may be appropriate for this active surveillance uh, paradigm. And I forgot to mention this active surveillance means that we're following, we're doing periodic ultrasounds to document whether or not these nodules or these tumors are growing. Um, and this is based on the, the ATA 2015 guidelines that stated active surveillance in lieu of immediate surgery could be used in patients with very low risk tumors. So they don't specify a size here, uh, but the two centimeters um, is based on uh, the, the idea that these are considered smaller tumors. So then the question is, what, do, what if I do not want surgery, but I want something done for my two centimeter thyroid cancer? So, and, and also there is a, a very recent publication that, uh, that I actually just saw today that uh, sort of goes into this uh, about how people might decide one way or another. And it actually comes down to your level of comfort with the idea of having a, a thyroid cancer that you're not, you're not going to treat. You're just going to watch with ultrasounds. And so the patient's values, motivations, and anxiety levels might contribute to or uh, drive that decision-making. Uh, and so one of the new therapies, newer therapies that uh, we've been using quite frequently for benign nodules is radiofrequency ablation. And that's a, a technology, uh, if you're not familiar with it, um, which I'm sure many of you are, but is uh, where you use a, a probe. It's, uh, it's like a, a needle that um, is inserted under ultrasound guidance in the office while, with, while you're awake. Uh, laying down and the needle probe goes into the nodule and then treats the nodule by delivering uh, energy. So this picture on cartoon on the, the left side of your screen basically shows how this red line, which represents the needle, sort of goes in multiple different spots of this theoretical dark gray thyroid nodule. And then what it does is it heats up the tissue and that causes the, that causes tissue necrosis or cell death in the, in areas uh, around the tip of the catheter. Um, and then there's these little triangles here that are shown. Those are the called the danger triangles. And that's essentially where the, the nerve that controls your voice resides. And so we, we stay, keep enough distance away from that danger area in order to make sure to protect that nerve, just like we would in surgery. Um, so in terms of how does this apply to thyroid cancer? Well, there it's not currently standard of care or indicated to, um, to use this option, uh, but it is in multiple clinical trials. So um, as a matter of fact, one of them is here at uh, Johns Hopkins, led by my partner, Dr. John Russell. Um, and so for, for patients with uh, nodules two centimeters, uh, smaller than two centimeters, who would be eligible for active surveillance um, and want to go that route, but want to do something about their, their tumor, but not surgery, they're, they're eligible to undergo through this trial, this radiofrequency ablation to destroy the tumor. Um, there was a, a, some data already published on this here uh, by uh, Dr. Zhang um, and co-investigators where they actually did uh, a trial and they took 98 patients with papillary um, thyroid microcarcinomas and um, 
in 95, 96% of these patients, their tumors had resolved based on the ultrasound features within one year. Uh, and furthermore, there was no residual or recurrent tumor tissue detected um, in the area that had undergone the radiofrequency ablation or residual thyroid tissue during the follow-up. The, this group also didn't have any suspicious metastatic lymph nodes show up. Um, and the, uh, furthermore, some of these patients also had a, a biopsy just to confirm that there was no tumor there. Um, and, uh, and that indeed confirmed it in, in this cohort that they did not have residual tumor. So the RFA was effective. Um, and also they reported no complications. So this is very encouraging data suggesting that, you know, in, in the future, I think this is where the field is headed. And if you have a small thyroid cancer, this may become the standard of care one day, um, a, a very minimally invasive outpatient procedure, minimal pain, um, Tylenol for uh, afterwards to help, Tylenol and ice to help with um, the pain after the procedure. And along these lines, there's other, what we call thermal ablation techniques that also might come online in a similar vein, one being high intensity focused ultrasound, um, another being laser photoablation. Uh, and so there's, there's some really good options I think that we have um, coming uh, down the pipe right now that'll help patients in the future. So what about surgery? You know, are there any advances in surgical technique or are we, are we doing things the same as we always have? Uh, well, going back to our guidelines, you know, as I mentioned, we have options between removing the whole thyroid or uh, the lobe, depending on the size and other features of the, of the tumor. Um, and so that's, you know, the standard type of thyroid where uh, thyroidectomy, where we make an incision on the neck and we use a uh, uh, nerve monitor, monitoring tube in order to um, confirm uh, and help um, protect the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which controls the vocal cords. Um, so our, our technique hasn't changed um, a, a great deal. So when we do, uh, you know, for total thyroidectomies for um, patients with tumors greater than four centimeters or um, this extension of the tumor outside of the envelope of the thyroid, or if there's evidence of metastatic lymph nodes or um, distant metastasis to other organs uh, or risk factors like a family history of thyroid cancer or a history of head and neck radiation. Um, our total thyroidectomy, um, uh, you know, is, is done, um, you know, by is most effective by high volume surgeons that have the lowest complication rates. Um, and, uh, and then similarly, so with lobectomy, so removing half the thyroid, um, you know, there, there hasn't been, you know, a, a lot of difference, but, um, you know, we, we do see improvements in the outcomes. Um, again, as I mentioned with uh, surgeons who do this very frequently, but recall that, you know, one of our goals is to reduce the side effects of treatment. So, you know, we're still trying to balance this, uh, strike this balance between the side effects that we cause with treatment and oncologic control. And sometimes we just, we lack options for reducing morbidity. So this um, is a, a PET CT scan uh, from a patient with um, recurrent thyroid cancer and it essentially shows this yellow area on the on the cat on this PET CT scan is where the tumor is located and and for this there you know there there is no we don't have any options at the moment to to treat this type of cancer that without removing in this case the entire the the larynx or the voice box had to be removed and this is a picture of the uh, the surgical specimen. Other times, it seems that our resection will need to be very extensive. But then during surgery, we ask ourselves, do we need to go to that a great extent of removing tissue in order to prolong one's life? Um, so for example, this 
patient had a large thyroid cancer here. Um, this is a CAT scan um, and cross section here on the, the far left. And the circle is highlighting the tumor in dark gray. The black areas are the lungs and the white areas are the bones. This is the spine. Um, and you see it's sort of pressing in on the trachea, which the windpipe, which is this, um, this black uh, uh, sort of D-shaped structure here. And then this is uh, what we call a sagittal view um, right next to that, which is where you take a cross section kind of going right down the middle of the patient. Um, and you see, you know, this, this tumor basically touches the spine and goes all the way to, you know, the great vessels that come off of the heart. And then this was a bronchoscopic view in um, at the beginning of surgery. So this is basically using a telescope to look inside the trachea. So these are the tracheal rings here. You can see these rings and in the windpipe. And then this sort of, you know, bulge into the windpipe is that bulge of the tumor. So in this case, we thought, you know, we're going to need to remove a portion of this patient's uh, windpipe, which, you know, is relatively um, well tolerated, but it, there's a not insignificant rate of death with that procedure. So we don't take that lightly. Um, and in this case, it turned out that the tumor wasn't um, growing into the trachea, it was just sort of pushing on it. And we were able to remove the whole tumor without in, um, having to remove any portion of the windpipe. Uh, and we had, we got negative margins with this surgery. So the patient, you know, was, was essentially cured um, with minimal morbidity. Uh, the tumor had unfortunately already uh, six months earlier caused his uh, nerve to not work. And so unfortunately, after six months of the, the cancer having destroyed the nerve, we, we couldn't, we couldn't um, restore that, that function, but there are other options uh, for that. And, you know, the, the other thing we ask ourselves is, um, you know, as I mentioned, how do, we, how do we determine who we need to be more aggressive with? And for that prior patient, we thought we need to, you know, we will probably need to remove, you know, uh, the part of the trachea. And this patient, you can see that the, the tumor here, this is a CAT scan, again, a cross section. This is the windpipe here. Um, and the arrow is pointing to tumor growing into the trachea. And that patient, you know, you really do, it, you can't really do a, a, a more conservative surgery. In order to remove this whole tumor, you do have to remove part of the windpipe. And uh, similarly, this very large tumor here that uh, uh, was a recurrent tumor is essentially replacing the the voice box. And, and unfortunately, there's no way to remove that uh, without taking out the whole uh, voice box. Uh, so, you know, the, the good news is, and the really exciting part of, you know, where we're going surgically. Um, so, Right now, it's mostly in the setting of tumors smaller than two centimeters. So as I mentioned, those tumors that, you know, we're starting to, that are eligible for this active surveillance. Um, and now we're also doing trials to determine whether uh, radiofrequency ablation could be beneficial for these. Well, for the patients who still want to have their tumor removed um, at this, this stage, uh, well, there's, there's good news. There's remote access um, thyroid surgery. And so that basically means we're not making an incision on the neck, which is very noticeable and, um, and can make people very self-conscious. And there have been several different ways to try and remotely access the thyroid. So one is BABA, bilateral axillobreast approach. Another one is a retroauricular or facelift approach where you make an incision uh, right in front of the ear uh, and around, and then you use uh, endoscopes uh, or even a robot in order to tra traverse the neck to the thyroid, and that kind of hides the incision in the hairline, so that's uh, a, a more cosmetically appealing uh, approach. There's also axillary, so in the armpit, um, and, and as you can imagine, that's a pretty long reach. That also requires endoscopes. And then um, what we've been doing more 
uh, frequently at Johns Hopkins are uh, endoscopic or scarless uh, approaches. Um, I also mentioned robot here. Uh, we don't have as much experience um, in that here as our uh, colleagues in um, Korea, uh, but these transoral, so endoscopic approaches, essentially use small incisions on the inside of the lip as shown here. And we place uh, we place trocars through those incisions. So uh, while you're asleep under anesthesia, and then we place, uh, this is called transoral endoscopic thyroid surgery through a vestibular approach. The vestibule is this area between the, the teeth uh, and the lip. Um, and um, we place essentially our instruments through side ports and we place a camera through this middle port. So you basically have a surgeon operating with the instruments and then you have a, a camera holder um, who needs to be someone experienced uh, in order to um, show the surgical uh, anatomy. So this is basically the surgeon's view from what we see when we're doing the uh, procedure. So this is a, a picture basically, you can see this little tiny hint of white here. That's the left recurrent laryngeal nerve. Um, this is the thyroid here. And these things, these cases heal remarkably well. You see, this is so POD9 is post-operative day nine, so nine days after surgery. Um, you can hardly see the, the uh, incisions um, in, inside this patient's lip. Um, and there, you don't see anything on the, the neck, really, because we didn't make any incisions there. Um, this is a, a extremely satisfied patient two weeks after surgery, no scars. Uh, here, sorry, this is a, a, a patient who had a, a nodule that they did not want removed with the traditional um, surgical approach with the scar. Um, and then this was a very satisfied patient after the TETVA procedure. Uh, in terms of the, the side effects and risks of these remote access of, approaches, they're, they're similar to um, the traditional approach using a incision on the neck. Um, and uh, data from one of our uh, Thai colleagues, um, the rate of temporary hypoparathyroidism, so the parathyroids being the glands that control your calcium, uh, was about 18 percent so temporary. Those patients had recovery of their parathyroid gland function. Um, the rate of temporary recurrent laryngeal nerve injury was about 4% in, in this study, uh, uh, which, which is very good. Um, zero patients had a permanent injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Uh, about 1.5% of patients had injury to their mental nerve. So that's a nerve that gives sensation to the lower lip. So they had some numbness of their lower lip, about you know, 1 in 100 um, and then a handful of patients also, ex one patient experienced a, a hematoma, so bleeding after surgery, um, as well as some other minor uh, uh, complications like a seroma or fluid buildup uh, under the skin flap. And then uh, these are some uh, un unpublished uh, data that were recently, recently presented uh, at one of our uh, uh, society meetings by one of our outstanding uh, medical students, Stephanie Seo, who uh, essentially looked at our data comparing the transoral uh, thyroid surgery with the vestibular approach to ETVA. So um, as shown here in the darker bars and the TCA, which is the transcervical approach. And these are essentially looking at three different quality of life indices. So this VHI is a voice handicap uh, index. So a high score is bad uh, or worse. The EAT10 is a swallowing uh, index. And so that um, is here in the middle plot. And then the DLQI is the dermatology life quality index. So it's how people feel about their, their skin. Um, and so, uh, what, what, what we saw was that the, so T1 is time point one, T2 is time point two. So at time point one, the patients who had TCA or the transcervical approach uh, had much higher voice uh, handicap 
scores, so they had worse voice um, quality of life. Um, these uh, essentially equaled out at the second time point in follow up. And then the, the EAT 10 scores were uh, similar between um, approaches. And then the DLQI scores, that's the Dermatology Life Quality Index scores, um, you see here were much higher, which is worse um, dermatology quality of life for the, the tr uh, traditional approach here in the light blue at time point one compared to Toetva, the transoral uh, endoscopic approach here in the dark blue. Um, and again, these, these did equal, uh, they, they did um, stabilize out at the second uh, time point in follow up. So, in summary, transoral central neck surgery is safe. The operative times quickly approach the standard approach. Um, when, when one is first starting out on this, it takes longer. Um, but they quickly approach uh, the standard uh, time timing. Um, it reduces one element of the surgical morbidity, which is that of a scar, um, which can can be a significant um, hindrance on quality of life for some. Um, and you know we believe it's the 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 near future uh, of our field and forthcoming advancements. So in conclusion. There are now more options for the treatment of thyroid cancer than previous, as I hope I've relayed. And patient values and motivations are important in deciding on an option. And then finally, there are innovative technologies and techniques, such as radiofrequency ablation and transoral endoscopic thyroidectomy, that may decrease surgical morbidity without compromising the oncologic uh, control. And so this is what we're what we're striving towards. So I just wanted to thank the uh, audience and um, open up the floor to any questions. I'd like to thank our patients um, for uh, helping future patients and um, my my uh, partner, Dr. John Russell at uh, Johns Hopkins, as well as our chair, our thyroid tumor center, and our residents and staff. Dr. Harbison, sorry, I was I was unable to log in earlier as your host. Um, my name is Carol. I'm one of the Thyca volunteers. Do you can you see the questions, or would you like me to read them to you? Um, I can see them, and sorry, I didn't answer them in real time. I didn't uh, see them uh, coming in, but well, now I see them. So most of most most speakers wait till the end anyway. So we okay. have a good uh, eighteen minutes left anyway. Fantastic. So I'm going to just start from the the, the most in, first ones that came in. Um, sure. This one is uh, this this um, one asks. I am 32 and underwent papillary cancer surgery last year and had to do 175 millicuries radioactive iodine. I have significant issues with anxiety. Can you please address this? Um, so, um, you know, I, I think that I think that the the anxiety, uh, you know, around cancer in general is is a, a really difficult thing to address. And I think it's it's you know I think sometimes we underplay it. And I think you know it's one of the the areas that we need to do a better job. I think as a field um, in helping to address this, um, you know, in in terms of what can be done to address anxiety around um, treatment, if that is uh, what the question is asking. Um, you know, I, I think it's one, it's important to, to have a support uh, partner, uh, a support uh, group is even better, like NICA. Um, and in order to, you know, just talk about what it is that's causing the anxiety, I think that can have a major uh, that can have major impact on helping to, to cope with the, the stress around the diagnosis and the treatments. Um, you know, and I certainly think if, you know, if it gets to a level where it's causing significant hindrance in, in your, your quality of life, your ability to sleep, your, you know, if you find yourself isolating yourself, I think I would seek, you know, I would seek formal, uh, professional help in that, in that setting from a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Uh, 
All right. So uh, I'm going to go to the next question now. This one um, says, I have a 1.1 centimeter thyroid cancer with metastasis to neck lymph nodes. Um, are there any new ways of approaching this other than surgery and radioactive iodine? It seems that the changes are only for those that are in the thyroid. So, you know, at, at, at this time for, so first off, you know, I, I would ask about whether this has been uh, diagnosed with a needle biopsy. So if there are concerning lymph nodes, I would recommend having a biopsy uh, of those to prove that it's a lymph node metastasis. Um, so if it is a lymph node metastasis and you have a small thyroid cancer, um, I would still follow the, the ATA guidelines and I would recommend having a total thyroidectomy. Now that said, you know, we know that thyroid cancers like to travel to lymph nodes, even small or big. And, and so, you know, I, not, at this point, this is not the case, but, you know, I would speculate that, you know, in the future, we may have come to a point where we treat a small thyroid cancer, just like we would, you know, that any other thyroid cancer, uh, small thyroid cancer. And if there's, you know, just negligible, um, spread to the neck lymph nodes, it's, you know, there, there is, you know, for, well, let me, let me back up for a minute. Um, in, in some patients who have recurrence, um, in the lymph nodes in their neck, uh, if they're smaller tumors, um, we, we can just watch them because we don't, at this time, we don't have data to suggest that they're at risk for spreading to other organs. Really, it's just a matter of causing um, an effect on the local area. Uh, and so that would be the main consideration. But for this scenario, we don't, at this time, we're still doing, recommending surgery and, you know, possible radioactive iodine, depending on the, the number of lymph nodes that are uh, found. Uh, another one asks, after a total thyroidectomy with undetectable thyroglobulin for 14 years, now with a rising thyroglobulin at 30, a negative RAI scan, negative CT, negative PET scan, what would you suggest for treatment therapy scans if cancer is not being detected? Um, so that's, you know, I, I think in, in this case, this is one where, you know, we, so we, we had a, I'll use a, an example from a, a patient that, um, we recently treated with a similar scenario um, and we, we basically repeated um, our endocrinologist um, that I work with, uh, one of them repeated the PET scans um, about once a year. And, and at, at eventually there, were, there was a site in the neck that became PET AVID or started taking up the, the um, tracer. So, in, in that case, you know, uh, we did end up acting on it because we, even after we identified where the recurrence was, um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't large. And so we wanted to see if it would grow or not. It did end up growing and we did have to end up treating it. Uh, but I think, you know, for, for now, I think it's reasonable to, to repeat uh, a scan um, and, uh, you know, if there's no cancer being detected necessarily, um, you know, there, we wouldn't necessarily, you know, recommend a, a treatment. Um, I have a question saying how often and what post-operative imaging should be done on patients with stage two or beyond thyroid cancers greater than two centimeters. Uh, and, and so I think this you know, in part, you know, depends on your um, endocrinologist and, you know, there's, um, you know, essentially we use the, the thyroglobulin as a marker um, to, to monitor these, um, you know, the endocrinologist might use a, a nuclear medicine scan or a radioactive uh, iodine uptake scan um, to have a baseline. Um, and, uh, you know, and I, and I think, you know, it, you know, the, the, um, 
surveillance would be, you know, dictated in part by that. So I, I won't go into more detail on that because it, it's um, somewhat depends on the situation. Um, how is ethanol ablation being used and what kind of results are you seeing? So right now we're, we're not using ethanol ablation in uh, cancer treatment. Um, we're mainly using it in uh, uh, to ablate um, uh, cystic thyroid nodules that that uh, come back after um, you know a an aspiration. Um, but I'm not aware of it being used for thyroid cancer per se. Um, let's see. In Adam 2014. The number with low lobectomy is low, and around 30% of them had uh, RIT. Um, I'm not sure what RIT is. I'll come Those back to that. Maybe typos. It's hard to know. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'm going to move on to the next one because there's still. There's a lot of questions come in. Um, let's see, these are great questions and I appreciate them. As far as treatments for thyroid cancer, would your recommendations be any different for children removing whole thyroid versus half, REI, et cetera? Um, you know, that, that's a, a great point and thyroid cancers in, in children um, are, you know, uh, a little bit, different of a, uh, of a paradigm, um, you know, so uh, that, you know, that, that, that also has, is a very, a very nuanced question that, uh, that I, uh, that I, you know, I don't want to get too far into right now. Um, let's see here. All right. Um, I have a 1.1 centimeter Oh, wait, that was already answered. Let's see here. Sorry about that. Um, I'm 31. I had a right side lobectomy for a papillary microcarcinoma, unifocal, five millimeters, no extrathyroidal extension or spread. My pathology after surgery showed my tumor was BRAF positive. Uh, my surgeon is not concerned and thinks lobectomy alone was enough. What are your thoughts? So uh, for, for a papillary microcarcinoma, um, you know, despite it being, uh, BRAF positive, I agree. I mean, that's, um, uh, you know, we're not using that right now to do further treatment. Um, in terms of your family history, I think, you know, that, if, if we were discussing this before you had surgery, I think that would be a potential reason to, you know, have the whole thyroid removed. Uh, so, but, you know, again, you wouldn't have to, it would be, but it would be a, uh, a consideration. All right, let's see. Are there size parameters for treatment when there is recurrence? Or does any new thyroid tissue regrowth after total thyroidectomy and RAI need to be treated? Uh, very interesting question. And, you know, a question that we've asked ourselves um, as a field. And there are size parameters. And it basically depends on whether the tissue based on ultrasound is in the central neck. Um, so the central compartment um, or the lateral compartment. So your lateral, your the lymph nodes on the side of your neck. Um, and sort of our guidelines are, uh, our cutoffs are eight millimeters in the central neck or one centimeter in the lateral neck. Um, but, you know, we do see some variations in practice. And for example, you might see your uh, endocrinologist might recommend watching a lymph node in the lateral neck that is suspicious and is, you know, larger than one centimeter. So, you know, this is also an area that is, um, you know, open for research and improving, you know, our, our treatment paradigms. Why is two centimeters the upper limit for active surveillance? Um, it's a great point. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, you, 
the short answer is you have to pick a cutoff. Um, the long answer is we've used one and a half centimeters um, in several several you know studies now that have been done, and um, and and essentially the reason is because the uh, the ATA um, guidelines don't give really a size cutoff, and so uh, you know we feel that two centimeters is still a you know a small tumor basically because we know that you know once you know tumors less than one centimeter are behave much more uh indolently or benign um tumors greater than four centimeters you know are we you know those those are higher stage um tumors but you know these two centimeter uh, or smaller tumors are basically you know once you get larger than two centimeters that's that starts uh, to put you up, you know, into a uh, higher stage category. Let's see. I have Just recurring... so you know, there's less yeah. than this. There's about five minutes left. If if uh, questions are not answered, you can um, email Thika at Thika okay. org. Okay. Put this session and the doctor's name in your um, email, and then Thika will get in touch with him, and they'll get back in touch with you. So just remember that because we're about to end here. Okay. All right. Um, let's see here. Uh, recurring disease in the neck. I get alcohol ablation of nodes one to three times a year. Would Frady frequency ablation be an acceptable substitute, especially for tumors right under the skin? Um, you know, I, I think that the the ATA guidelines would, you know, suggest. Uh, well, depending on the size of the the nodes would suggest um, surgical removal. Um, you know, I think that under you know a, a research protocol, that that is actually something that we're interested in in researching um, here. So, uh, I I wouldn't I, I wouldn't feel comfortable saying it's an acceptable substitute, um, but I think that you know at some point it may be. My daughter. Next question. My daughter had two surgeries. Her neck was sore to the touch for a long time, a year or more, such that I recontoured her t-shirts to make them more comfortable for her. I think your options for less invasive surgical option has value beyond aesthetics. Yeah, thank you for that, that comment. Um, I completely agree. Uh, um, has there been any more research or experience on family clusters of papillary thyroid cancer? It appears that there is no option but to remove the entire thyroid. My daughter is now under active surveillance at age 20 with a one centimeter nodule, not yet cancer, but non-serologic lymphocytic thyroiditis, post-biopsy, B12 deficiency, low ferritin, MDG, multi-nodular goiter uh, with, or um, uh, yeah, goiter with significant eye gland dropout. This is a lot for a young person when four first degree relatives have had surgery and others suffer thyroid disease. I that that does sound like a, a stressful situation. Um, in terms of the research or experience on family clusters of papillary thyroid cancer, um, you know we know that there's a strong familial link, uh, but I, I can't really you know tell you much more beyond that. Um, you know we know that for example for medullary thyroid cancers the RET gene. Um, has a very strong familiar link, familial link, but um, in papillary, we don't haven't really seen anything like that. Um, I had a total thyroidectomy on August 9th, 2022. 1.6 centimeter tuber on the right side and three small ones on the left was a rare cribriform morular variant. Have not heard about other treatment options yet. Do I need to do anything different due to the rare variant? Um, you know, for this one, I would. This is one where we would discuss as a thyroid tumor center with our uh, endocrinologist um, for, you know, the consideration of, you know, radioactive iodine, for example. Um, but that's that would be what I would recommend for that. Um, I had a total, a right total lobectomy. I had it removed for nodules times three, and previously had FNA of the largest two nodules, FNA with benign results. Because I had compression symptoms, I had the affected lobe removed. Pathology came by as PTC, tall cell variant, 1.1 centimeters, um, extra thyroidal spread, negative 
ETE, negative margins, no uh, lymphovascular spread. My endocrinologist told me I do not need completion surgery, just ultrasounds every six months. Uh, is this a current recommendation? Um, and it is two o'clock, so we do have to end. But um, I, I, so yeah, if for tall cell variant, you know, this is a small one. I, I think that that's, um, you know, this is, this is basically in a gray zone. So, you know, I, in this case, your endocrinologist and surgeon, um, you know, will communicate closely together. Um, and I think, you know, it's worth, you know, monitoring this closely. All right. I think we have to wrap up there. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I feel honored Thank to you. have been able to uh, talk to you all. Thank you very much, Dr. Harbison.